Hello and welcome back to INMR. In today's podcast, I'm going to be talking to Whitstable Town goalkeeper Jordan Perrin. We talk about his time at Hale End in the Arsenal Academy with players such as Emil Smith Rowe and Reese Nelson, leaving the Wigan Academy and the professional environment at just 19 years old, and the lessons he's learnt along the way. All that and more is coming up, so I hope you enjoy. Here's Jordan's story. So yeah, whenever you're ready, if you could just start off by letting the listeners know who you are, who you play for, position, just like a little bit about yourself. Yeah, cool. So I'm Jordan Perrin. Uh, I'm a goalkeeper currently at Whitstable Town. So playing uh, in the Scaffold League. The last few seasons I've been in non-league. I've uh, been in only five seasons now. Uh, been at Herne Bay, Sittingbourne, here from Belvedere and Whitstable Town. So I've only been with Whitstable a few few games but um, yeah enjoying it there already so lovely so you said that you've obviously got a lot of experience in the non-league looking at sort of your profile throughout your career you've got a lot of experience at different levels if we go right back to the start what is your first football in memory my first football in memory um it was actually my my school at the time so in primary school we're doing like a, a summer sort of summer fair like a stall for like penalty shootouts and things like that so um, yeah, my old man said to me, like, just, why don't you have a go? I'll never, he didn't play football himself. No one in my family really did. So he said, just give it a go, see if you like it. So I had a couple of penalties. Don't remember if I missed them or scored them. But yeah, so, and then from then on, really, the, the club at the time was a, a team called Wigmore Youth. So that's my first sort of youth career sort of thing I did or who I went to. Yeah, and then literally they said to me, come down on a Saturday morning, come do some training. About the age of four or five at the time. Um, so really young, I was thinking I might have been in nursery or year R. Um, yeah, and that was my first sort of football memory. But I was only, I started off as a defender actually, so I was only a defender for a matter of a few weeks. Um, but I was always one of the tall ones. So they said, Oh, would you mind going in goal? We had no goalkeeper. So I naturally just went in goal. Um, and then I think it was, it was a one on one. I actually remember quite clearly for that age um, coming out and just literally just normal set position and just, yeah, I think I made a good block. And ever since then, I've been a goalkeeper. So, yeah. Quite a young start then. Yeah. From that point, obviously. You know, a lot of people we speak to, it is normally something so um, normal, like playing with someone in the park or at school. From there, how has it progressed from back in school all the way to where you are today? Yeah, so from that moment, really, it's kind of a, a real up, uphill journey, really. Um, yeah, I played with more from the age of about five to about seven. Yeah, sort of, you know, no competitive football at that age. So just like danger, friendlies and loads of training. Um, I went and got like some personal training as a goalkeeper. As we've got goalkeeper coaching and things like that. And um, yeah, from then on, really, I went on to having trials at Chelsea, Millwall, um, Charlton, and Arsenal. And they got to the age of about nine where I had to choose where I wanted to go. So the offers were on the table were Charlton and Arsenal. But with a little bit of a story, really, I was going to sign for Charlton on, I think it was just, just after my ninth birthday. Um, and the night I come back, we had a mum and dad said I had a, a missed call in the answer machine. They said that. Arsenal had asked me to go and sign for him, but I'd already signed for Charlton. So, um, obviously, my dad had a good chat with the Arsenal academy manager and said, like, obviously, just see what happens next season. I was only a one-year deal, I signed at Charlton. So, um, and then, yeah, a year later, I went on and signed for Arsenal, left Charlton. I think that season that I played against them when I was at Charlton, I think we won we won a couple of games. Um, I think we might have drew a couple, but I don't think I lost the game. I only conceded about two or three goals. So, obviously, a small side of games then as well. So, um, and then, yeah, I spent... Uh, six, six, seven years at Arsenal until I was under 16. Um, had the conversation about getting a scholarship. Wasn't going to get a scholarship, was going to get a, an extended school boy if I wanted it. Um, but my sort of options were I could go elsewhere and obviously do scholarships around the country, loads of different clubs. Um, and I think at the time it was, it was my, my time to move on, really. Um, I had a fantastic youth career at Arsenal, went to some amazing places, played some against some amazing players as well in my time. but. At that stage in my career, I just finished my GCSEs and I wanted to sort of like leave home and try and sort of venture for myself really and made the opportunity um, to go and play for Wigan Athletic. So I signed a two-year scholarship and a one-year pro at Wigan, literally as I started there. Um, so I was guaranteed three years to sort of progress and move on. And in my pro pro year, I played a lot of games out on loan in non-league. So I think I played something like 40 games that year on loan. So through, through, from three different clubs. One was uh, Stockport. Town, so they were, I think, their step five and non league at the time. They were had a couple of games with them, got recalled, went out to um, FC United of Manchester, so quite a big club there in the Conference North. Played a couple of games there, um, just to cover the goalkeeper while I was injured. So that was a fantastic experience at 19 years old playing Conference North. Um, and then, yeah, went on to play for Runcorn Linnets, who are a team in step three, I believe, now up, up north. 
and yeah, I played some like thirty or thirty or games for them that season as well. So yeah, pretty uh, pretty good experience playing on loan at nineteen years old. Yeah, very busy by the sounds of it as well. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so obviously, with uh, the Arsenal Academy, Hale End is known for being one of the best academies in the world. Um, what was that sort of environment like? And you know, the players that you must have played with and against, who are sort of some of the names that you look back on now and go, I shared a pitch with them. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a weird one because I see my the photo of me flying around on social media sometimes with Mill Smith Rowe. So we were in the same team together. So it was me and Mill Smith Rowe. Uh, Reese Nelson was in that year group. Um, Danny Ballard, who's now at Sunderland. I'm trying to think else in that group. There's a fair few like players that have gone into either non-league or gone into the pro game, and it's um yeah, it's just it's it's been some amazing achievements. Obviously, played against the likes of Sancho and. Um, Phil Foden now all the same sort of age as me so they're the sort of players that you played against and things like that so but I played against some amazing players in my time and obviously look back and obviously my career's gone a different path and there's gone a fantastic path but um, that's, that's part of football and, and I'm, I'm glad to have the chance that I did when I was younger to obviously play at that level and play against some amazing players that obviously you see on the TV now. Yeah definitely who would you say I mean as a goalkeeper who was the hardest attacker that you had to face in your youth career? I think it was a hard one because I had two of them on my team. So I went in training, it was always Smith Rowe and, and Nelson. They were just there, it was just a joke. Um, Reese always played up a few years above me. Um, so he was playing, I think, under 18s when we were under 15. So he was just like, yeah, it was just amazing. Um, a lot of people thought Smith Rowe would do well, and I, we all believed that he did. And he's gone to have a career, fantastic career at Arsenal so far, and he's got so many years in front of him to do well. So, um, but I think probably playing against. To be fair, the couple of players that I remember now, I can't remember the names, but I remember the faces that I don't think they're even playing football anymore. So it's crazy to think that from the age of 16 um, and 15, like, so I'm, I'm 24 now, so like eight years later, they're not playing football anymore, but they were the ones that were going to do well and anything like that. It's just sometimes the game happens like that. But I think, yeah, Nelson and Smith were just, you know, joking, training. Like, I don't think they ever just save anything. Yeah, obviously, like you say, a lot of people don't make it and it's a really harsh environment. Who in particular has guided you and inspired you along the way during your career? I think for me, um, my old my old man, my dad, um, and my mum as well, and also my little sister as well. So for me, it's more of the fact that my dad's always been there. He's always taken me training three, four times a week, giving me ex coaching, taking me places, buying my gloves for me. Um, as I found out now, they're quite expensive. So, um, but things like that. And my dad's always been that one that's that's taking me to where I need to be. Um, even like to now, he's. He's pushing 60 now, so he's even come to my games now. So he's not so much, he never played football himself or was a goalkeeper really. So um, he was like into his motorsport and things like that. But as I've sort of grown up, he's got more into the football. He, he knows more about football than I do. So, um, but yeah, he's, he's been that sort of guy to keep me in the right path. Like when my mates were going out on, on a Thursday night, like up the park or something, at like 12 o'clock at night, my dad kept me in the right direction to be able to, obviously, so I could achieve as what I could in, in the career I have so far. Definitely. And a lot of people that I interview always say their parents and stuff like that. In terms of somebody that doesn't, you don't know at all, but that you'd watch on telly and go, I want to replicate that. Who who guided you in that aspect as well? So I had a, I had a few really. I had a um, bit more of an outsider really that I think done really well. And there's already the last few years that sort of slipped off. Is, um, I think Jack Butland, just his playing style, um, the way he, just the way he distributes the ball, um, the way he carries himself, his communication. It's just, yeah, a lot of people will be like, you expect them to say, like, your Joe Hart's or your Jordan Pickford's. But for me, it's more like Jack Butland. And yeah, I think just, just his mannerisms uh, reflect mine and how and how he acts as a goalkeeper, how he carries himself is a lot sort of the same as me. Um, a lot of people try and compare my communication and the way I am to Jordan Pickford. I'm quite, I wouldn't say rash, but um, I'm, I'm very vocal on the pitch. Um, I think for me, communication is key as a goalkeeper. You've got to be able to, be able to talk to your back line. Um, and communicate and I think if, if if I was a defender I'd want a goalkeeper behind me who can communicate and help me out through the game as well so um, but yeah for me Jack Butland was always that one that I looked up to I think I had him as my as my home screen a few times just his, <laughs> the, like kicking a ball and that things like that Yeah you mentioned your communication would you say that's your biggest strength on the pitch? Um, I think it could be my biggest strength and also my biggest downfall so sometimes I'm uh, I uh get caught up in the game too much. I think it's because the emotions run yeah. so high. But yeah, for me, I think communication is massive, but everyone's known me as the 
around my level there's a, there's a noisy keeper, the one who shouts and always having a go at people. But for me, it's, like I say to my teammates, it's nothing personal. We all know it's nothing personal. It's just encouragement and making sure that we're all on the board, on board together to obviously achieve the goal we want to. But I think for me, communication is a big one. Um, when I was younger, I was always not as confident to speak. I'd always get told by the coaches and my old man, like, he's talked more, like, you're not communicating enough. That's why a lot of the goals sort of went in because I wasn't telling people to be where they need to be. But as I've got older and I've watched more football and things like that, I've um, I've developed that myself. So it's one thing I'm pretty proud of, really, communication. I've, I've come a long way from that. Yeah, and I think with goalkeepers, there's always sort of this misunderstanding because it is so different to everything else that you do on a football pitch. Would you say that being a goalkeeper is sort of the loneliest role and how hard is it in those low points to be a goalkeeper? Yeah, look, for me, a lot of people, <laughs> it's the argument that goes in all the time between your, your outfield players, your strikers and your goalkeepers. Um, everyone kind of neglects the goalkeeper. Um, unless you're a sort of your goalkeeper yourself, really. Um, we understand as goalkeepers ourselves, Obviously, a lot of people hear the saying goalkeeper's union, but it is a union. Um, it's people that understand when we're going through the highs and going through the lows. Um, a lot of people just see the goalkeeper as, yeah, as the person who stands in goal and keeps it out of the net. And when we don't keep it out of the net, we're the first ones to blame. So, But as a goalkeeper, I think, in my opinion, it's the hardest part on the pitch. One, because it's mentally, it can affect, it can affect you mentally. You can make one mistake and it can go in and you've got a whole crowd behind you giving you a load of rubbish. Um, but then also you've got the maids and highs of keeping a clean sheet and saving a penalty in the, in the penalty shot at the final or whatever, things like that. So as a goalkeeper, so many highs and so many lows, just find that midpoint, which really a lot of us goalkeepers don't sit at that midpoint all the time. But yeah, look, I, I love being a goalkeeper. It's just what I, it's what I love playing football. I wouldn't be. If I, I don't think if someone said to me we're being outfield, I don't think I'd change it. It's just something I love doing. I know we still seem a little bit crazy sometimes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a lot of people tell me I'm quite normal for a goalkeeper, but... Um, you know, I debate that myself sometimes. Yeah, I was going to say, I know I've got a few friends who are goalkeepers and they're some of the craziest people I know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you mentioned about um, highs and lows in football. Obviously, that is a massive part of it for everyone. You're never going to... It's difficult for anybody to ever achieve that midpoint of just being content. What is the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome in those low points? I think for me... Um, when I was told they weren't going to renew my contract at Wigan. So I was 19 years old, living away from home. I've been away from home three years, uh, moved away when I was 16. So the first point of obviously moving away, I was away for six weeks, weren't allowed to see my parents because the managers and that said that you want to have the the apprentice, the apprentice or the scholar, the scholar basically settle into obviously your digs life and being away from family. Because as a footballer, as most of us know, and obviously your listeners know that it is a lonely career being a footballer sometimes. Um, long away days, staying away from family, Christmases, things like that. So there's lots of highs and there's lots of lows, obviously, about obviously being a footballer. Yeah, and our previous guest, he was uh, in the QPR Academy for eight years and he said the hardest thing about coming out of the academy was no longer being around the professional environment and having those standards that are set so high. How did you find coming out of that elite scene initially? Yeah, so look, for me, it was a massive difference from obviously your, your Cat 1 Academy as Arsenal going to Cat 3 Academy at the time was Wigan Athletic. Um, obviously, I know they're a Cat 2 Academy now, like they're doing really well. The youth they bring out of that, of that academy is fantastic. And I've got so yeah. many teammates that I played with at Wigan who are now playing the first team. Not a, a huge shout out to Sam Tickle, who was a goalkeeper a couple of years younger than me, who isn't the biggest goalkeeper, but as a, as technical ability and raw ability, he was one of the best goalkeepers I've ever worked with or ever seen. So, um, yeah, a massive congratulations to him as well. But a lot, a lot of different moving into non-league as well. Um, I'm still used to trying to train as much as possible. So you go from basically a full-time training and obviously gym routine to coming out into non-league where you're training twice a week, sometimes once a week. Uh, I've been with clubs that obviously sometimes for the once a week training, sometimes I want two days a week training. I've also been at clubs that want to train more than that. But for me, is I found it, I found it was hard that coming out of the, non, of the full-time system and moving to non league that you don't train as much. You have to look after your body a lot yourself. When you're in that full-time environment, you've got your like your sports scientist, you've got your physiotherapist, you've got your nutritionist, you've got all that. And you come into non league where some clubs have got that and some clubs have just basically got your bare minimum of just a, a, a manager, assistant and a physio. So. Um, it's hard to adapt to it, but for myself, I try and keep my standards as high as possible um, by seeking outside, obviously, um, physiotherapists and nutritionists and things like that. It does help, but 
to be fair, big shout out to the club I'm at at the moment, Whitstable Town. For a step five team, so it's the lowest I've played in my, in my career so far. Um, they have been obviously a step above, but they're just a club that want to do things right. They bring the right people in, so they've got a goalie coach, they've got um, sports scientists, they've got everything involved in the club. The fans are fantastic as well, so um, it kind of makes it a little bit easier. They try and train as often as possible. They obviously, train Tuesday, Thursday. If they train more, they train more, but they give you stuff outside to work on. So it's a bit more. It feels a bit more of that full-time environment. It kind of helps you. Obviously, I've been out of the full-time environment nearly five years now. So, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a hard adaptation at first, but it's one of them you get used to. Yeah, of course. So there's a lot of changes. So how how do you deal with that mentally? And what impact did that have on your career for the first potentially few years? Yeah, I think, to be fair, the first few years are actually easier than, than it is now. So because I've been out of the game so long now, you get into your habits of not probably, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I'm just not going to have a night off. But when you're in the full-time system, you, you can just, you're just being told what to do, when to do it. But now you've got to take it on yourself to look after your body and things like that. So. Um, it, it's, it's difficult, so obviously I, I work a full-time job as well, so I'm, I'm a construction site manager. Um, went and done a qualification when I come out of the full-time game. Qualified a couple of years ago, which I'm, I'm quite happy with. But now I, I, I leave my house at half five in the morning, travel two and a half hours to London, and then work a, an eight till five job, and then travel two and a half hours home or two hours home, depending on whether I'm going training or whether I'm coming home. And then you've got to balance that thing of when you get home at seven o'clock and you're tired, I need to go to the gym, but do I want to go to the gym? It's them things that are hard that you're in a full-time environment. You just automatically come out of, off, the, off the training pitch, have a shower, have some lunch, and then maybe an afternoon session in the gym. But for now, because you're trying to cram everything in itself, it's uh, it's, it's difficult. Obviously, you're working a full-time job as well as trying to balance football on the side. But um, for me, I try and keep my standards high as possible. And I still love doing what I'm doing. As long as I can play football, I will. Yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, like you say, it's holding yourself accountable and having that discipline because it's so much harder when you're in that semi-pro environment because it's almost spoon fed to you professionally, do you think? Yeah, massively. Like, I think you take it for granted, even myself, and I'm sure other people that listen and obviously other footballers as well will agree that it's such an easy, I say easier way of life, but it's, you've got everything in front of you that you want. So it's until you come out and you realise you haven't got that no more and you've got to find it for yourself and put your own effort in. Yeah, it's hard. Obviously, I'm not saying that no one, we don't put our effort in when we're in full-time yeah. environment, but it's a lot harder when you come out. You have to find them things yourself. And it's it's difficult, especially for myself. I was 19. I know a lot of people never get the chance to have a scholarship. So, yes, yeah, so I can imagine it's even harder at that age. But obviously, because I was a little bit older, I, did, I left home. I spent time away from family and things like that. I kind of adapted a little bit better. It was actually harder coming home because you're used to doing your own thing away from home and you're coming home to live with your mum and dad. And they, they obviously you have your own habits and things like that. So yeah, it's, it was good to be back home, but obviously I wanted to carry on the journey. But obviously yeah, that wasn't that wasn't the case. Yeah, definitely. And now you say you've recently joined a new club. If you take us through a typical match day from the moment you wake up to the end of the day, what's that like? Yeah, so I'm a, I do my own coaching. So I've got my own goalkeeping score. I've started recently, so I normally do a bit of coaching Saturday morning. So I wake up around sort of eight o'clock. Um, so that's a that's a line for me compared to my normal week. So. Um, Saturday, yeah, get up and coach coach a couple of sessions, one to one sessions, or I've also coached a little uh, a little team called AFC Minster, so uh, under 12s team. So I coach a little goalkeeper there and help out on the sidelines on obviously Sundays and things like that. So yeah, wake up back then, do a couple of hours session. Depends on obviously the away game things like that. Um, the league I'm playing at the moment, I think our first away game is only about an hour and a half, so it's not too bad. But for the rest of the fixtures this season, it's, it's not too bad. It's quite close. So um, yeah, I wait. Obviously, wake up go and coach and then come back have a bit of breakfast about half 10 11 o'clock to be fair I'm not a big one of eating too healthy on a match day um, as a goalkeeper I'd rather be happy with what I've eaten so to be fair I can have it could be a bowl of cereal it could be some toast to be fair it might even be a cheeky sloppy sandwich sometimes mm -hmm. um, as a goalkeeper I'm quite lucky I haven't got to be running around but I always feel that I eat healthy and clean throughout the week I'm prepared white and on the, on, the day, on the match day I feel like if I'm happy with what I'm eating and I'm not too heavy or um, eating too much, I feel quite happy. Um, and then obviously it depends on the home game. Home game, I probably leave about half 12 to get there for one o'clock. Um, quarter past one, just somewhere a little bit earlier in the meet time. Um, I'm I'm a sucker for uh, Starbucks on the way down. I just love, love a caramel yeah. latte. A lot of people will be like, caramel latte for a game, but that's just, that's just my own routine that I like and I feel comfortable doing. Um, and it's one of them things that I've, I've, I did a whole season that I got promoted at Herne Bay. So 
I just kept it going since then. I've been doing it sort of two and a half years now. Um, but yeah, and then I get to the game, just sort of relax for the game. Um, nothing too strenuous, really. Go and have a look at the pitch. We play, we play on 4G, so it isn't too much changing all the time, really. It's the same sort of thing. Like, obviously, the game we had the weekend um, against VCD, uh, their pitch is lovely. They play the women's um, Charlton Athletic team play there, so that's a lovely surface. But obviously, it'd been raining, um, just making sure I look at the surface. Obviously, I'm always a stud in the winter, no matter what. I need to chill out, really, get myself ready. Um, yeah, listen to a bit of music with the boys, have a good bit, of, bit of banter with the boys in the changing room, and then come two o'clock after the team talk. Normally go out. I don't have too much of a mad warm up because I've done my preparation throughout the week in training, things like that. And obviously Friday night I have my own preparation and, things, and stretching and stuff like that. So come quarter to two, I'll go in, make myself ready, get my shirt on, my shorts, my socks, and then um, yeah, come three o'clock, ready to go. And before the game, do you get pre-match nerves often, or are you fine? And if you do, how do you deal with that? You know what? I uh, yeah. I've been, I played five games with Whitstall so far, and my first game was in a quarter final of the Kent Cup. And for the first time in a little while, I was actually a little bit nervous. Um, even though I've, I've taken a step, I've taken a step down up to play for Whitstable, it's it's still them nerves that because I'm not sure I've not. It's the expectations. I know a lot of people were saying, "Oh, uh, obviously we've got we've got Jordan Perrin in from here from Belvedere." It puts a little bit of weight on your shoulders, but once I get that first touch in the game, I'm I'm all right. So it's that first touch really. I think the first one was a, was a cross coming the box and I claimed it well. So once that was it out of the way, I, I felt comfortable. But obviously, yeah, I do get, I still get uh, pre-game nerves now. Um, but there's been games that have been even of a sort of like higher standard that I've been absolutely fine with. But I think it was because of the expectation on my shoulders. I was a bit like, yeah, it's a little bit of nerves kicking in. New club, new boys. Um, I think I only trained once with them before I played as well. So but yeah, now, now I'm settled in. I feel, feel like part of the furniture. So. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of the time it is that expectation. I know me personally, I get really nervous before games, but I had a game maybe a few months ago and he was like, right, Izzy, we're going to put you at right back. And I'm a winger. But because there was no expectation of, oh, she's a winger anyway, she shouldn't be good at right back. I played really well. And I think that's a lot of it. A lot of the time you're getting yourself worked up because people are looking at you and thinking they should be doing this, they should be doing that. Whereas when that's gone, a lot of the nerves do go. Yeah, exactly. For me, like I, I can't really like yourself. I can't, um, I can't go and play right back or right wing or whatever it is. But um, for myself, like yeah, it's it's one of them. It's it's normally the games that you least expect it is when the nerves kick in. A normal game, I'm not too not too bad with it. Be the games that don't really mean too much, or you've got a bit more expect, expectation on your shoulders where you go, actually, I've got a bit of nerves here. But I think it's natural to have nerves. Um, it's part of the game. It's why we love playing it, and it's the adrenaline you get from it as well. Yeah, exactly. So, post-match, obviously, it might be different for a goalkeeper. This is my first goalkeeper interview in a long time. So, how <laughs> would you recover from a game? When I was in the pro game, it would be a little bit different to what it is now. Um, for me, a standard sort of non-league thing you do is go and have a couple of beers in a bar. It's just part of non-league. Obviously, I'm not a massive drinker anyway. I try and keep myself in as best shape as possible, but there's nothing wrong with a couple. Especially, like, obviously, we run on Saturday. So it's obviously going to have a little bit of a couple, a couple of drinks to celebrate. And obviously, it's good to sort of sit down with the boys and just uh, sort of reminisce about the game and obviously what went well, what could be be, what could be done better as well as talk about like obviously weekends, personal things as well. So, um, but normally I'll come home, I'll have a big carb meal. So I love, uh, I don't know, Domino's, takeaway, things like that. Because obviously, as goalkeepers, like, people think that we don't burn calories, but we do because... Your, your, your brain is constantly going in the game. That's our part of the game is, is our mentality and our concentration is stay, has to stay higher the whole 90 minutes. Um, and obviously, as like nowadays, games go into 100-minute games and things like that with extra time and added time and things like that. So, um, yeah, normally just so what I do. I love, I come on, um, have a carb, carby meal. Might be a Chinese takeaway or something like that. But, um, and then come Sunday, I'll, I'll go straight into my coaching Sunday. So I've got coaching Sunday and then come Monday again, back on to the meal prepping and things like that. So I have a little bit of a blow up meal some uh, Saturday afternoon, um, yeah. Saturday evening, and then into the week, ahead ready for preparing for the next game. Definitely. Just quickly, because you mentioned about concentration, Aaron Ramsdale did that interview a while ago and he said, oh, I can't focus for 90 minutes. And I think everyone was quite shocked about it. What were your thoughts on that? Because you've just said, you know, it's so difficult to keep on a high. And he, he obviously mentioned it as well. I totally agree because when I was younger, and uh, I'm sure my dad vouched for me, I used to get to 60, 70 minutes and I'd switch off 
and I'd go and let a goal in something silly or I'd, I'd misplace a pass because I'm not concentrating. And as a goalkeeper, he's just human. He's, he, us goalkeepers aren't robots and that's why I think I've got so much respect for Aaron Ramsdale and obviously the situation he's in at the moment where he's a top-class goalkeeper um, and obviously what's going on, I'm an Arsenal fan anyway, so what's going on at Arsenal is obviously I have my own opinions about it, but for him to come out and say that to the public, it's just what us goalkeepers would say anyway. Um, I'm not saying we don't concentrate and also people would take that too too much really. Um, yeah. That he doesn't concentrate the whole time. He does, but he has laps of concentration where I think he mentioned he's, he's, he sings a song or something. Or I can't remember what he said, but it happens. As goalkeepers, we've got to concentrate for the whole 90 minutes. When the ball's up the other pitch and you've not touched it in 10 minutes, we've just got to stay there concentrating the whole time. So I can understand that I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll be singing on the 80th minute if we're like 1 0 up. I'll be singing a song in my head. It's just that's what mm. I do. But I think he means it as in, in the way that. He yeah, does have laps of concentration and sometimes it can get boring. And when you're in the game, when you are making loads of saves, it's easy to stay concentrated. When you have got them games where you haven't got a lot to do and you've got to make that one save at the death to keep it at one nil, they're the concentration that you obviously need to, need to have. But for me, full respect to Aaron Ramsdale for that. Um, a lot of us goalkeepers are like it. Yeah. You said, you know, that you've had a lot of moves in your career and this season you've just recently joined a new side. For this season, what are your short-term targets and over the coming seasons, what are the long-term targets? I think personally, my my targets at the start of the season, I think have changed compared to what they are now. So yeah. I moved, I was playing with Herne Bay last season in step three, so Ishmael and Prem. Um, got relegated, it was our first season there, so I got promoted the season before. Fantastic achievement for the club, the highest the club's ever been at. Um, didn't quite work out, came straight back down to step four. Um, left the club because certain reasons. I'm not going to discuss that. But um, yeah, and then got into a club called here from Belvedere, who uh, come out of step five, went into step four, had good ambitions, had the right way, had a fantastic manager in uh, in Matt Longhurst, and um, yeah, basically wanted me to come over and be part of it. And I think it didn't go the way that we I wanted it to. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was a bit of a risk at the start, um, but it's one of them where it was going from a team that will probably dominate in step four to a team that have just come into step four, not knowing if they're going to do well or not. Um, but for me, I was always, I'm young, young. I wanted the challenge um, and I made that decision. And I think it didn't go to plan for financial reasons, things like that. And I won't get into too many details, but um, like nothing against the club. The club's a fantastic club. And obviously I hope they do stay in the league in step four. Uh, big club deserve to be there. But for me, I think my, my, my long-term goals then were to, basically to get promotion and I think now my it's more of a short-term goal for me because I'm obviously 13 games to go into the season I know we've got a semi-final and a cup and that but my my short-term goals now are to obviously get in the playoffs um, in the league I'm in now and win the cup semi-final and the King Cup so hopefully get some silver on the table get come May as well for, the, for obviously the final of that so um, my long-term goals originally obviously were to win obviously we'd win set four get promotion out of step four um, but obviously it changed, obviously once I left the club, um, for my own personal reasons, I wanted to leave. Lovely. And what is one thing that a coach has said to you at any point in your career that has stuck with you? Oh, I've got a couple. Um, I've had I've had a few goalie coaches in my time. I've had one goalie coach is isn't even working at any clubs really, but I see him as probably one of the better coaches I've had throughout of my time. His name's Kenny Adai, so his son, his son, you've got two sons, one's Corey, he plays for Corey Town, great goalkeeper, and also Dylan Adai, who's his younger brother, he plays, he's actually been out on loan, he's come on loan to here from Belvedere, so, but yeah, so for me, he's always one of them ones that's catch it, so he was a big believer in try and catch everything, um, and that was just something that stuck with me, I just remember him shouting in training, catch it, catch it, catch it, um, that was one thing, and then, Another one was uh, polish your strengths and work on your weaknesses. Um, and that come from a guy called Alex Welsh, who I know a lot of people will know. He was asked as a uh, Callum McGoldy coach for a long time. I, work, I had the pleasure of working him when I was under nine, uh, actually under 10 at, at Arsenal. Um, fantastic guy. I know he's, a, he's a, um, a great guy and he's obviously had a lot of effect on people's um, career so far. And he's, yeah, he's a brilliant guy. But that's one thing that sticks to me is polish your strengths and work on your weaknesses. So what I took from that is polish your strengths um, so basically making sure that even though your stuff could be really good, but then you don't want to neglect it even though you're working on your weaknesses. So, uh, yeah, so that's one I've taken from him. 
Yeah, I like that one. Um, final question for you is, what are three pieces of advice you would give to a young player looking to make it as a professional footballer? Um, I think the most important one I'm going to say is enjoy it. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what level you make it at. As long as you're enjoying your football, that's all that matters. Like, don't get me wrong, I'd love to be playing in the Premier League. I'd love to be playing in the National League now. But as long as I'm enjoying my football, that's the most important part. The second one is just just literally any opportunities, never turn it down. There's been times I've had opportunities that I've looked back on and gone, maybe I should have just taken an opportunity. I think there's been times throughout of my sort of, from my career from maybe leaving Arsenal to now, there's been opportunities that I could have taken and I didn't take them. And now I look back and I think, yeah, maybe I should have, that could have maybe got me to where I wanted to want to be now. And thirdly, I just say, just work hard. Just just keep working hard. Any opportunities you get, just take it with both hands and then work hard. It may be pain at the time when you're obviously doing them runs or you're doing them dives and you're knackered, but trust me, in the long run, it'll work out because I get to 24 now and I wish I'd done more stuff and I probably would have been playing higher than what I am now. I'm not saying I would have been, but I'd like to think I would have been playing higher now. Definitely. And you know what? Enjoy it is the one we get every single time, which I think highlights just how important it is because you get so caught up in football that sometimes you do just need to take a step back and go, look, you love the game. So just whatever makes that feeling highest, just go for that. So yeah, enjoy it. Brilliant piece of advice. Yeah, fantastic. Lovely. So that is the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Izzy. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye.